available directories uh, for tomorrow for OpenAP, OpenACC, and CUDA. For today, we just have the directory on standard language parallelism. And if you look at the README, it shows we've given you two source files to look at, um, one in Fortran and one in C++. I recommend doing both, even if you only use one of those two languages, because it's really not, there's not any real code exercise. It's just practicing around compiling and running. And we've given you a, a brief README, which explains what's going on, what the prerequisites are for getting it running. And then um, the uh, set of like little exercises just to get practice compiling and running the code for both the Fortran and C++ cases. So I recommend going through these and whether you're running on uh, Perlmutter or on Summit, we've given you hopefully enough instructions for compiling and running. And then in a little bit, I will come back and say a little bit more about these exercises uh, to show you what we were thinking.
going. We're happy to be. Okay, so I just want to briefly <clears throat> touch through these exercises and and tell you what I think or what we hope you, you might get out of them. Um, so I'm in the, I've already done the Git clone. I'm in the um, Studpar directory. Let me just get rid of anything that I might have, make it clear. Uh, so you'll see right now there's just the Studpar directory. In the Studpar directory, we have two files, a Fortran example and a C++ example. <clears throat> The Fortran example is solving a linear system, um, AX equals B. And it has, it creates a matrix A and a vector B. And the way it's going to solve it is using the standard BLOS operations that first do an LU factorization of the matrix and then do the solve using the factored uh, matrix A. It first initializes the matrix A with some random numbers. It then fills in the um, some guess at B, or rather it creates, it fills in a, a right-hand side B, and then it does the factor and then the solve. And then at the end, it checks uh, to make sure that we actually got the right answer, which we, should, we can know um, because we know what A and B are, and we know the relationship between A and B, we should be able to just do a sanity check to make sure that we got the right thing. Now, the um, this example <clears throat> uses a matrix that is size 1,000 by 1,000. And it's using a number of standard Fortran APIs, but can be run entirely on the GPU. So this call to random number that will fill in the matrix A, as well as this do concurrent operation that initializes um, modifies the, the matrix A and fills in B, as well as these BLOS operations can all be done on the GPU with the support that the NVIDIA compiler has. That requires you to turn on a couple options, uh, which we'll see in a moment, but you can also just run this on CPU. So that's the first exercise that we list. This is just run this uh, example on the CPU. <clears throat> in order to do that, we say, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm doing this example on NERSC um, right now, but it's similar how you did it at Oak Ridge. You can see what our requirements are for the NERSC environment. The, we want you to have the program dash NVIDIA loaded on Perlmutter. Um, that's part of the default environment. We also want you to do module load CUDA toolkit, which is not part of the default environment, but easy, just one line to do. And so you can see what my module environment looks like here. So this is basically the default environment, but with this additional CUDA toolkit loaded. Now, the first um, exercise is just to compile and run the code. So the only non-standard or the only part of the code that is not just immediately part of Fortran is the calls to the BLOSS APIs, dget rf and dget rs. Um, in order to do that, you'll just <clears throat> do dash l BLOSS. If you just do dash l BLOSS, then you'll use uh, the BLOSS library that we ship or the, the support from the NVIDIA Fortran compiler. However, you can, of course, use other BLOSS libraries on the system. So if you wanted to use you know, MKL or some other um, BLOSS library, you could absolutely do that. And then you would get uh, this, this you know, test DGTRF uh, CPU um, executable. Now we've given you a sample submit script that you can use to run it. You can take a look at it. We have one for both NERSC and for Oak Ridge. You can see that this is what it looks like. This just re um, reserves a single node <clears throat> for five minutes. And it simply just reloads those modules and then simply does S run in the name of the executable. So I should be able to just do S batch in the name of the executable, submit DGRTF nurse.sh and then I will submit that batch job. Hopefully that will run pretty quickly because it's a um, quick job and also it's part of this reservation. Uh, as usual, we'll get a slur map file, which will uh, record the output so I can cat that. All of that this code does is it prints out either test passed or test failed. Test passed would indicate that we got the expected answer from the linear system cell. So this one worked, <clears throat> CPU code worked well. To compile it for the GPU, all we need to do, the only thing that we need to do 
is change the compilation flags. The compilation flags do get a little bit more involved though. So as before, we're going to, um, first of all, I'll give it a different name, indicate that we're now doing the GPU build. <clears throat> we're gonna need to add a couple of things. So first we're gonna need to add dash sudpar. Dash sudpar means we wanna take all the standard language constructs, in this case, do concurrent, and then run them on the CPU. We're also going to want to add that we want to pick up the linear algebra and run it on the GPU. So remember Brent said that that's the NVLA math. Um, and then that, so that looks like NVLA math. That requires the CUDA um, 11.4 backend. So I'm doing NVLA math comma CUDA 11.4. And then the last thing that we need to do is um, tell that we want to support uh, the CUDA libraries. So we need to pull in any CUDA libraries that would be relevant for this GPU support. In particular, we're going to want to support the math libraries as well as um, the random number generator Curan in order to uh, generate do that random number call that we said. So that should be enough. There, as you can see, we have to turn on a number of options, but that's all we had to do was modify the compiler flags in order to get this example to run and hopefully now run on the GPU. In order to make this run on the GPU, <clears throat> what we can do is simply modify our submission script and then use the updated name. So now we've compiled with an underscore GPU extension to the name. So I'll just go ahead and modify my submission script and then submit that new uh, code. Again, I'm doing this all at uh, Perlmutter, but if you are trying this on Summit and you have any questions, please let me know and either I or someone in Slack will be able to assist. Okay, so if I cat my new output, 434.out, great, test passed. Okay, so the GPU build worked. However, it'd really be nice if we could actually verify that this thing actually ran on the GPU. How do I know that it wasn't just falling back to the CPU that I perhaps I made some mistake when I compiled and ran it? How do I know it actually was using the GPU? The way that we're gonna, I'm gonna recommend doing that is to use Enside Systems. Enside Systems will record any GPU activities that occur and then tell me about them. So I can modify my submission script and add <clears throat> NSYS profile before the executable. Remember I showed you from the slide, NSYS profile means collector profile of this application. If I add also the flag dash dash stats equals true, then that will say print at the end of the run, print out a, a summary to standard out of all of the GPU activities that occurred. So I can immediately verify whether um, there was any GPU workload that occurred. We can also give it a name. So I'll just call this one, you know, test GETRF GPU, and then it'll automatically append the right file extension to it. <clears throat> um, so that we know that this was the profile corresponding to that particular executable. So that's what I would do in order to collect a profile of this application. So I've saved my file. I'm gonna go ahead and resubmit that script and then see what's different about my um, slurm output when I have completed that. <clears throat> okay, so already got the job started. Let's see what we got. Okay, so first you'll get the output from the application, test passed, that's great. Um, and then you get the output from the profiler itself. The standard out from the profiler is broken down into several sections. Each of those sections gives you a different a summary of different kind of information. The first section that's printed is the CUDA API. So these are all of the calls into CUDA that were generated on, this, on the CPU in order to generate GPU related work. Remember I said that CUDA is the underlying platform which supports all of these programming models on the NVIDIA platform. <clears throat> so even though um, we didn't write any CUDA in this example, CUDA is being used under the hood by the compiler in order to do all the work. So we can see all of the CUDA operations that had to occur if this is something you're interested in on the CPU in order to support the GPU workload. Then we have CUDA kernel statistics. Kernels are the actual GPU compute work that occurs. And the you get a, um, and it's a little bit too long as you can see, so it's falling over to a second row, um, but you get in each row, the total percentage of the time spent on the GPU for each kernel, 
as well as the name of the kernel, and then some other statistics about how much time was spent total in that kernel, as well as how many calls to the kernel, and how much average time has been in each call of the kernel. The name of the kernel in this case is generated by either the, the compiler or the library. It won't always be super um, intuitive to you. <clears throat> so for example, this test deg trf underscore 17 underscore GPU is actually fairly informative. It's telling me that it's happening in my program test deg trf on line 17, and that it's the GPU code that's being generated. If I look at line 17 of my file, um, that is this do concurrent loop. So it's telling me that it's generating a GPU kernel corresponding to that call to do concurrent. And then a whole bunch of other ones with names that are less informative to you that are generated by the calls to the linear algebra. So you can see actually a fair amount of work is being generated to support this linear system solve. You don't have to worry about all of the code generation that's occurring, it just works for you. As you can see, there's a fair amount of um, logistics, but it gets the right answer. You can also see operations of memory copying back and forth from the CPU to the GPU and vice versa. Uh, somebody asked in chat about the fact that sometimes the names of the kernels get cut off if they're very long. Unfortunately, um, <clears throat> it, there's really nothing that I can tell you to do about that in this um, standard out that we can get. However, you can get the full name of the kernel when you actually open this profile in the user interface, which I'll show you next. So this showed you, this confirmed that data, that operations were actually occurring on the GPU. What we would tend to do, what I would normally do next is to go ahead and load this report into the user interface to get a timeline view of this. This is just a summary, right? It, it tells you what happened, but seeing it in a timeline is much more powerful than just getting a standard out text summary of what goes on. Okay, so we helpfully got at the end of the output a information about the, the name of the file on the file system that we saved. It has the name that I was asking for, test deg trf underscore GPU, and it has this .qd rep file extension, which is the native report format of NSAT systems. As I mentioned, this was renamed in the very most recent release of the tool, but it uh, has the same kind of, it works the same way. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that file, the name of that file, and then I'm going to open up a terminal and do, I'm going to SCP that file from Perlmutter to my local system. So I can just use standard SCP for that. I'm going to give Perlmutter colon and the path to the file and then just copy it to some location on my local computer. <clears throat> um, Steve asks, can I repeat the command to build to enable profiling? You don't have to change any flags in the build in order to turn on profiling. There are separate activities. So the, the GPU compilation flags are in the readme here. Um, so you can copy this dash sudpar, dash CUDA, dash GPU, dash CUDA lib. These are all necessary for turning on GPU support. And then um, exercise, the text for exercise three says what you need to do in this profile dash s dash equals true in order to collect the profile. Um, Okay, so I have copied this report file from my from Perlmutter to my local system. I already have the NSI systems user interface up um, because I was showing you a, an example report before. <clears throat> what I would need to do is I would need to go to file and then open, and I would need to locate this file that I just downloaded on my file system. Um, so I already happen to have it open to the right directory because I happen to be using something before. So I can see this test deg trf underscore GPU. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that and click open. And then I get a timeline of this application. <clears throat> um, remember we said that it shows you both CPU and GPU activities. The GPU activities are in this CUDA hardware row. And then all of the runtime API calls um, that, for example, the CUDA calls that I was showing you that are orchestrating all of this work are here in this row. Additionally, you can see load on all of the CPU cores that are being used if you want to. So this can be useful for understanding when and where was there any load on the cores in the CPU. 
what I really want you to pay attention to is the CUDA hardware row, because this shows you all of the actual compute and memory work that happened on the GPU. So <clears throat> there's a little, everywhere that the row is blank, nothing was happening on the GPU. And anywhere that there's any color in the row is where things were happening. You can see there's a sliver of time here where there's something happening on the GPU, and then a sliver of time here where there's something happening on the GPU. And that's pretty much it. The timeline runs from the beginning at zero seconds to the end at something after six seconds. So the GPU work is actually um, constricted to a fairly small chunk of the timeline. This first bit here is going to be <clears throat> the call to um, do concurrent that initializes the data. So you can see that this, if I zoom in really far, that the kernel that's being run here is this test deg trf underscore 17 underscore GPU. So this is that do concurrent loop on line 17 of the code. And then I have to zoom all the way out. <clears throat> By the way, to zoom in and out, you hold down control um, and then you can use either the, or I think it might be command on Mac, hold down control or command. And then you can use like your mouse scroll wheel if you have one, like a pinch and zoom motion if you're using a touchpad to zoom in and out. I have to zoom all the way out in order to see, um, or I can just click right click and do reset zoom. I have to zoom all the way out and see this GPU activity that actually does the linear system solve is happening at the very end of the run. So it's constrained to a fairly narrow chunk of the timeline. <clears throat> Um, and I could see the names of these kernels if I wanted to. They're not, these aren't going to be super useful to you because these are the um, individual kernels that are done by the linear algebra library. So the names of the kernels aren't relevant, just, but the fact that you can see names like GETRF is indicating that this is the work that's corresponding to the linear system uh, work. So if I reset, <clears throat> what I see is that only a very small chunk of this timeline is actually using GPU. Almost all of the work is setting up data um, or handles. This is a pretty characteristic thing that's true about GPUs, where setting up work on the GPUs is fairly expensive. Initializing the GPU is expensive. Allocating memory is expensive. Um, and so if you don't have a lot of work to do, you may be killed by these initialization costs. Generally speaking, you want to hold on to allocations as long as you can. You want to hold on to memory handles as long as you can for like um, any handles you might generate for calling into APIs. And you want to run as big of a problem as you can. <clears throat> if you look at the example, um, this has a thousand by a thousand matrix. So the last exercise, that I'm, and I won't show you this, but um, I recommend you do it on your own, make this a bigger problem and then see if a longer chunk of the timeline is spent on the GPU. You might even be able to ask yourself the question, did I make this problem big enough to am effectively amortize out the cost of the initialization? Now, this particular example wasn't set up to show you like excellent performance. So <clears throat> there's ways to write code that, um, that mitigate this behavior, but it is worth knowing that in general, initializing data and the GPU state is expensive. So you want to reuse as much memory as you can. And typically that will work out to something like run a code that launches a large number of iterations or time steps or something like that. So you can amortize out that initialization cost. Um, so yeah, try making the problem bigger and see if that uh, affects the shape of the profile. <clears throat> We've also got a C++ example, which does a std transform in C++. Um, that uh, Matt set up and kind of resembles the thing that he was showing you in his um, lecture. And so what it does is it creates two vectors, X and Y. These are just um, arrays with size N, which in this case is a million. We initialize them to some data and then we do A times X plus Y. <clears throat> in the context of the C++ parallel algorithms, one way to implement that is with std transform. Uh, and then with std transform, you tell it the um, a vector as well and the first point or the first pointer or location in the array, and then how many um, pointer offsets later to stop at, <clears throat> as well as the second vector. And then the last argument is the receptacle or the output of the of the data. So in this case, we're basically doing an in place update to y, and then you write a lambda, which basically says I want to return y plus a times x. And that's the SAXP operation. 
and then just a check at the end. <clears throat> so you should also verify that you can compile and run the C++ example. You can also um, practice collecting a profile with inside systems in order to see, to verify that GPU work actually occurred on the GPU. Um, any other questions? Oh, um, is there an option to run some parts of the code on CPU and some on GPU? Uh, the short answer today is not really. Um, we don't really support like a mixed mode. Certainly you can use, in the context of OpenMP, if you use um, non-target regions, then you may be able to combine OpenMP host threading with GPU target regions on running on the GPU. But there, are, in general, we don't support something like having multiple C++ parallel regions like std transforms and having some of them run on the GPU and some of them run on the CPU. That's a little bit too challenging and tricky for us to implement. And also, <clears throat> honestly, there are very few circumstances where you would want to do that. So today we don't support that. But if you have a really compelling use case for why you'd like to mix those things, you can always reach out to us and we'll be happy to hear you out. <clears throat> yeah, um, there was a question in Slack. Can I just go over one more time what this whole thing is? So it may help to um, look at the, if you Google the API for Stud Transform to go along with it. But basically, um, I. Let me go over through these arguments one by one. So the first argument is the what we call the execution policy. Execution policy is a statement about how we, it's it basically telling a, the, the compiler some, some statement about the relationship between the iterations of the for loop. The execution policy, really what it means is telling the compiler, how should I generate code to do this loop? And that can either be done serially so I run the executions of the, the loop one by one. If you think about this std transform is really representing a for loop, like this for loop above from zero to n, <clears throat> then a serial execution policy would basically mean generate code which looks like this for loop. So iteration zero is before iteration one, et cetera. Um, but we can also give it parallel execution policies. And in particular, the one that, that we're using here, um, par underscore um, unseek, means that it's both parallel and that there is no specified relationship between any particular iteration. So I can do iteration 1,000 before iteration 0 or after, or explicitly telling the compiler there is no particular relationship or dependency or data dependency between iteration 0 and iteration um, 100. That gives the compiler freedom to generate a fully parallel loop on, behind the scenes to implement this, and that's exactly what it's going to do here. <clears throat> and then. The um, first, the, sec the second argument and third argument are the beginning and end of a particular array or iterable. Um, and the third argument would be a second thing because std transform is basically combining um, two pieces of information. And then the, the next argument is the output of the data. And then what it's going to do is it's going to pick a, a set of data um, from X and Y, and then give it to you in scalar form, X, L, and Y, L, um, as read-only data. And then the return value of the Lambda is what I want to do with that particular combination of data from X and Y. This exam, this API assumes, by the way, or it, it because it's you're giving it both the starting and, and ending location of X, it's basically assuming that you're going to be doing the same kind of offsets into Y. So any particular Lambda is doing you know, x of x0 and y0, or x10 and y10, um, and then it's combining those two things together. And then the, the lambda basically says, what do I want to take from those two values and then store in y0 or y10? <clears throat> If I have some OpenMP instructions in my code, but I compile it with no OpenMP options, um, <clears throat> then no, the compiler should not, should just ignore the OpenMP fragments. 